Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth meeting of the committee for 2019. Can I ask that all mobile devices are switched to silent, please? Agenda item one is Age of Criminal Responsibility Stage Two consideration. Item uh, uh, consideration. <coughs> Uh, we completed parts one to three of the bill last week, and today we are looking at the remainder of the bill. Can I welcome Marie Todd, Minister for Children and Young People, you. and her officials? And to begin, I call Amendment 25 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move, convener. Thank you. I call Amendment 24 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move, convener. I call Amendment 122 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 123, 60, 61, 62, and 63. Minister to move Amendment 122 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. Uh, members have rightly taken a keen interest in the police power to take a child under 12 to a place of safety at section 23 of the bill. During stage one, I made it absolutely clear that the place of safety provision is an emergency power and that it's restricted to a clearly articulated lawful purpose. That is to protect people from an immediate risk of significant harm or further such harm. I emphasise that a police station would only be used as a last resort and for the shortest time necessary before somewhere else could be found. I also confirmed at stage one that I would not object to an amendment to include the full definition of a place of safety as set out in the Children's Hearing Scotland 2011 Act. To make it absolutely clear that the same range of safe places can be used for this bill's purposes. In the stage one report, the committee accepted that in rural areas, such as the one that I represent, it might be difficult to avoid the use of police, police stations entirely, and asked me to bring forward <coughs> amendments to prohibit the use of cells in the context of police safety provisions. I completely understand and have made very clear my views on this matter. However, I think it would be challenging to completely prohibit this option where there's no safe alternative locally. It wouldn't be acceptable in such situations for a child to be transported, in the case of my region, hundreds of miles away simply on the basis of a lack of a safe place to take them. And we've prevented the one possible safe place that might be available for such discrete and limited circumstances being used. I accept and I would expect that such situations will be extremely rare and that data recorded about the use of the power would bear this out. For these reasons, I think it would be wrong to prohibit the use of cells entirely, but I do wish to place very clear limits on this. My Amendment 122 therefore inserts two new subsections which make clear that a child must not be kept in a police cell where a police station is used as a place of safety unless and only for as long as it is not reasonably practical for the child to be kept elsewhere within the police station. Amendment 123 is technical and is in consequence of Amendment 122. I would hope that the committee supports my Amendments 122 and 123. Turning now to Alec Cole Hamilton's Amendment 60, which is intended to ensure that where a police station is used as a place of safety, the child cannot be kept in a police cell. <coughs> Amendment 61 has the same effect in relation to a child under the age of 14 and was consequential in Amendment 2 being agreed to in day one. Amendment two has, 62 has the same effect in relation to a child under the age of 16 and was consequential in Amendment 1 being agreed to in day one. I have made clear my view on an outright prohibition, but Mr Cole Hamilton's amendment is also problematic because of its definition. In short, most police cells are not legalised police cells. Legalised police cells are cells in police stations which are far from the nearest prison and which can be used to hold individuals for longer than is normal um, for a police cell. So the amendment wouldn't prohibit the use of police cells except in the four cases of legalised police cells um, where they're still in operation. So that's in Hoyek, Lerwick, Kirkwall and Stornoway. I would hope, therefore, that Alec Cole Hamilton will accept that his amendment does not quite achieve the effect that he was seeking and consider not pressing it. 
if Mr Cole Hamilton decides to move amendments 60, 61 and 62, then I would respectfully ask that the committee does not support them. I had previously committed to bringing forward an amendment to provide a full list of places of safety, but I accept that Alec Cole Hamilton's um, amendment 63 does so, and it also reorders that list so that a police station is named last and only if no other place of safety is available. Section 23.5 already sets that out in different words. Um, the limited circumstances in which police stations may be used as a place of safety. So I, I may wish to reflect before stage three on the precise implications of that duplication. Subject to that, Alec Cole Hamilton will be pleased to know that I'm very happy to support his amendment 63 if he does move it. And to speak to amendment 60 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I'm glad we're debating this group today. I think everyone will agree that this uh, group of amendments stems principally from the uh, testimony we heard from Lindsay Hanvich and the, uh, the impact of her experience on the night that she was taken into care of being arrested, charged and kept overnight in a cell. As I said uh, in last week's proceedings, in the middle of one adverse childhood experience, this state handed her another. Um, it seems to me that um, we, we don't have a great deal of information about how often cells are used, but we know they are are used, and it's uh, troubling that that is nowhere codified or understood. Um, so, in terms of my amendments, and I understand the, the semantic point around the, the term legalised, this was uh, legalised police cell, this was um, on advice of clerks that I put these amendments in, but I uh, would still seek to press these and then bring forward additional amendments at stage three to catch uh, the rest of the cell estate. Um, I, I think this is about throwing one's cap over the wall. I think that uh, when we um, hint at the idea that cells may be used in certain circumstances, then they will be. But uh, there will always be times, even in remote and rural circumstances, where the cell uh, estate within a police station is just um, out of use or, or not appropriate, given that there may be other offenders within that uh, cell estate. And at that point, uh, police officers in that situation would have to come up with an alternative, better use of safety. So if they are forced to, in those circumstances, come up with a better um, place of safety, then let's do it from the start. I don't think we have anything to lose by ruling out and uh, allowing our, our friends in the police force to think more creatively in advance of these situations and to strategize about what they would do in certain scenarios. Uh, so to that end, um, I am keen to press my amendments. I am grateful to the minister for bringing her amendment 122. And initially I, I was uh, thought there was merit to it. Um, I, I quite like the idea of stating on the face of the bill that a cell shouldn't be uh, acceptable and shouldn't be used. My anxiety though came in 5B, which is that uh, it sort of sets the parameters of when a cell is needed to be used. And for me, I don't think it's written anywhere in legislation that children that there is an appropriate time to put children in cells. It's just happened by happenstance. But by actually putting it on in primary legislation, my anxiety is that it will act as a gravitational pull um, to suggest to officers um, in, in a crisis situation that a cell is something they might want to consider. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to oppose uh, section 122. I'm very grateful for um, the minister in indicating her support for my amendment uh, 63. Um, I think she's articulated exactly why I've done it. I think that my anxiety, which I know was shared by the majority of the committee at stage one, was that because police stations were the only place of safety referred to on the face of the bill, albeit to be used um, in, a, in a time of last resort, they may end up just by virtue of the fact they are the only one being referred to, ending up as the default. Um, so I'm glad that this uh, amendment has been accepted. I think it's an important to demonstrate on the face of the bill the range of safe places of safety that should be sought out before a police station is even considered. And for those reasons, I wish to press my amendment. Okay. Oliver Montel, you wish to come in. Thank you, I, convener. I'm, I'm sort of struggling with um, mo most of the amendments um, in in this group uh, for, for a variety of different reasons. I think the first thing that I would say to, to Alex Cole Hamilton was that you know, in, in rural communities, you know, the, the idea that there, is, that there is a better place uh, is, isn't necessarily correct. I, I think for a lot of children looking at their best interest um, and, and what their wishes might be in these circumstances, they would rather remain within their own community than go to a residential uh, facility, a hospital, 
um, that, 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 could, that could be out with their own home community. Uh, so I, I find it difficult uh, to think that, that the use of a police cell uh, sh should be should be uh, ruled out altogether, uh, probably for the same reasons as the minister. Um, I also, I mean, I was inclined uh, really to support um, Amendment One Two Two. Uh, however, the, the, when, when I look at the language, I'm happy to listen again to what the minister has to say in her uh, sort of summing up her response. But uh, when I look at, at the use of a cell where it's not reasonably practical for a child to be kept somewhere else. Um, I, I don't know yet whether that's quite the right language. I think I, I would prefer a test that looked at the child's best interests rather than just just what was what, what was practical. Uh, but I, I'm happy to happy to, to sort of hear um, you know, if, if if there's a if there's a reason for that. Um, and on Amendment 63, I think on balance we probably will uh, or, or will support that. Uh, but I would be concerned at a suggestion that the list is set out was a sort of order to to sort of work through of preference, because again, I, th I think that uh, in, in these difficult circumstances, we should be looking at what would be best for the child, uh, rather than, than, than what's immediately uh, available. <coughs> um, and I think, you know, that again, for me, the idea that a residential establishment would be preferable for a child uh, than perhaps a dwelling house of a suitable person uh, who'd be willing to help out, you know, again, I don't know that that, that is actually correct. Um, but I'd be happy to revisit that at stage uh, three and, and support that amendment for, for today. Thank you. Um, Mary Fee. Um, um, thank you, Convener. I just wanted to um, speak very briefly in, in support of the amendments in, in the name of um, Alex Cole Hamilton. And Alex Cole Hamilton was right in his remarks that I think, without doubt, some of the most compelling evidence that we heard when we were taking evidence for this bill was the evidence that we heard from um, Lindsay. Uh, and I think if nothing else persuades us that a child should never be held in a police station, it's the evidence that we heard from her. Um, I Initially, wh when I looked at the amendment um, 122 in, in the name of, of the minister, um, I was um, supportive. But I am slightly conflicted because the first um, section of the amendment says a child must not be kept in a, in a cell within a police station. And the second one almost gives permission for a child to be kept in a police station. Um, and, and I think we need to be absolutely clear in this legislation that a police station, if to be considered at all, should only be considered when every other option has been has been ruled out. Um, and and for, for that reason, I, I cannot support Amendment 122 in the name of the Minister. Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I, I hear what, the, what, what, uh, what Mary Fee is saying, but does she recognise that in some circumstances, maybe where a child is uh, at danger of harming themselves or, or harming others, that it might be better to be in a police cell uh, than to be physically restrained or um, in the case of uh, rural communities, for example, waiting in a police van uh, while police officers are phoning round looking for, for another alternative that the cell for a short period of time might be a better option than that. No, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I don't accept um, the, the points that you make. I, I think you, you have to look at the psychological damage <coughs> that you can do to a, sometimes a, a very troubled um, young person by holding them in a police cell. Um, and I, I would press very strongly that, that a, a police cell is not a place that you, that you should be keeping a troubled, um, a troubled young person. Would the member take an intervention? Certainly. I'm grateful to Mary Fee for taking the intervention. Does Mary Fee agree with me that actually we need to have a much larger conversation about the provision of crisis facilities for young people? One in nine children in this young people uh, in this country will run away at some point in their life, but, but we don't have a refuge for young runaways in Scotland anymore. And uh, it's stock like that, facilities like that, that really we need to start building in capacity, building in right across Scotland, which could answer some of these needs. Absolutely. Um, and in agreeing Alex Cole Hamilton's final point, I will conclude my remarks, Convener. Thank, Thank you, Mary. Um, Fulton McGregor, then Gildall. Thanks, Convener. Um, I, mean, I don't think, it, or, or, or most of us in the committee, uh, need any persuasion that um, a police cell isn't a place for a, a child to be uh, to, to be held, as Mary Fee and Alex Cole Hamilton said. But I think that the amendments brought forward by the Minister and Alex Cole Hamilton's amendment at 63 achieve what we talked about during committee that there was a it was the place that was on the face of the bill um, and there, there was possibly a 
uh, an indication that then that would be the the first place used. And I think that the amendments put in uh, send a clear message that it should only be used if there is no other uh, options available. And by putting it further down the list, it takes away that that anxiety. Um, I don't. I also don't think the legislation should be too prescriptive to local communities. Local communities. Uh, police officers, social workers and others that are working in local communities uh, have got a better handle on resources to try and avoid situations like um, like Oliver Mundell uh, mentioned there. I, I, I don't think it's acceptable that if a cell is the only place available to, for, for a young person to perhaps be stuck in a van. You know, so I think that the, the amendments 122, 123 and 63 uh, alleviate my concerns around that and I'm happy to support them. I won't be able to support 60 to 62. Thanks. Gail Ross, you want to Thank you, uh, convener. And I must say, when we started out um, with this uh, evidence on, on cells, I was of a mind that we needed to take it out altogether. Um, I, I did a little bit of research on my own, obviously coming from an extremely remote and rural area of the country and we need to travel 104 miles to Inverness for nearly everything. So um, I spoke to uh, some people and I think that we're doing a disservice to say that just because it's on the face of the bill, people are gonna use it as a default. I think we have to trust our authorities and our social work and our police to say, you know, as it says in the, uh, in the amendment, it is only as an absolute last resort. And you talk about psychological damage of putting children in a cell. I agree, it's also extremely psychologically damaging to put them in the back of a van and travel 104 miles away from their family and away from people that they trust. So I really do think that when you balance it up, the amendments from the minister do um, address those concerns but I really do think and this is coming from authorities locally and they have said that all options need to be kept open but they need to be trusted to make these decisions on a case by case basis so I will be supporting the amendments from the Minister. Okay. Minister to wind up please. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I felt that the amendments that I had brought forward were addressing the concerns that the committees ra raised at stage one in a pragmatic way and um, put in place a strong presumption against the use of police cells, which I felt was um, helpful, making it clear that children should absolutely not be placed in a police cell unless that's the only way to keep them safe, um, which I would expect to be a very rare occasion. I've heard the committee's views and I'm, I'm listening as I have throughout this bill process. If the committee is telling me through their concerns, which I think they are, that they have misgivings about these amendments, um, then I would seek an opportunity to explore them further with committee members ahead of stage three if they're agreeable um, about how we might resolve the concerns to see if we can arrive at an agreed approach to defining a place of safety for the purposes of this bill. And if we don't have if I don't have support, I will not press my amendments at this, but I would ask the member not to press his amendments either. So, Minister, it would be a, 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 um, you, you would need to withdraw the amendment okay, if you I'll wish to. Yeah, I'll withdraw my amendments. Okay. Our, is that one, two, two, and one? Two, three? three. Yeah. Okay. Are members agreed? Does anyone object? Yeah. Yes, agreed. Okay. Amendment one, two, two, and one, two, three are withdrawn. Okay. Um, call amendment sixty in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Move, convener. The question is that amendment sixty be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Committee is not agreed, um, so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 60 to raise their hands? And those against? The result of the division is for the Amendment 2, against the Amendment 5, the Amendment falls. I call Amendment 61 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 122. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move, convener. I 
call Amendment 62 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 122. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 63 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 122. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? question is that section 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 24 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Um, welcome Daniel Johnston to the committee and call amendment 100 in his name in a group of its own. Daniel Johnston to move and speak to amendment 100. Um, well, thank you very much, convener, and can I begin by thanking all members of the, the Equality and Human Rights Committee for welcoming me here this morning. It's always enjoyable being a visitor at a committee that you're not normally a member of. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, my amendment uh, number 100, I think, very much follows on from the, the discussions that we've just heard. I've been very struck as a, a member outside this committee, I think, with the seriousness and the sensitivity that this committee has approached uh, the issue around places of safety and I, I think it stands to reason um, that it is important that we consider very carefully about what places we use as places of safety and the impact that has on children and the sensitivity that we must have with regard to these matters. Now I approach much of, uh, of what we deal with in this place but also from my previous working life from a very simple principle which is this, is that if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. And I think, for the reasons that I think Alex Gore Hamilton set out, I think very eloquently, we need to take great care in terms of managing how uh, places of safety are used, and in particular, what types of places are used for these places of safety for children. And for that reason, I think it's hugely important that we have a measure uh, of how frequently the various places that are designated as places of safety are used and by type. And that's what my amendment seeks to do by making a requirement for an annual report, uh, giving a, 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 a breakdown of uh, the use of places of safety by type so that we can understand how this is being used and so that we can take our collective duty of care seriously and respond to requirements uh, as they arise by having this information in front of us. Um, further to that, I would just like to also draw members' attention to um, uh, 2C within my amendment, which is a, a, a regarding the use of police cells. And I think we've just heard, I think, the issues around that. There is a balance to be struck. No one would uh, choose to put a child in a police cell when you did not have to, if there were other places available. And while this amendment, I think, uh, does nothing in terms of making uh, or reducing the possibility of the use of police cells. What it would do is make it very clear uh, when uh, those cells have been used so that we can understand uh, how uh, frequently this is being used as an option and thereby uh, take steps to, to mitigate that as appropriate. So uh, in, in conclusion, uh, you know, I would just um, uh, ask for support for this amendment because I do think it's really important that we have a very full and clear picture about how uh, places of safety are used, and I believe that this amendment would make that possible. Thank you. Do any members of the committee wish to come in? Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm grateful to Dan Johnson for bringing this amendment to committee today. Welcome to the committee, Dan. Um, I think in the context of my amendments, which have just fallen around prohibition of cell use, this is a, a vital uh, string to the bow of this bill. Um, what struck members, every member of this committee, I think, during our consideration at the stage one was the paucity of information that exists around place of safety provision right now. There is uh, anecdotal references to uh, children who've been kept in cells overnight and, and certainly the evidence we heard from Lindsay Hanvich, but no empirical data. Um, I think that if uh, police forces or anyone involved in delivering uh, a, place, a place of safety to a young person at a time of crisis um, was mindful of the fact that they will have to record that, report it um, and account for it, then perhaps decision making would ha um, happen in a different way. Um, I think it's a very uh, welcome um, intervention here by Dan and I think I recognise that we can pass this amendment and it isn't incongruous to the fact that we've just rejected amendments to prohibit cell use because this doesn't prohibit cell use it just say um, confirm that you've not used a cell but 
the, by extension, you would have to explain why. So for that reason, I will be supporting Dan Johnson's amendment. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, convener. I, I'm uh, generally supportive of uh, the, the amendment because um, I like other aspects of the bill, I think it's important that we do have reporting information on which to uh, base decisions. I do now obviously note that there's this issue with the, the legalised uh, police cells that I think will be a little bit odd, but I think there's no reason why that couldn't be tidied up um, at stage three. But I'm also conscious that the Minister had made in reference to other uh, reviewing uh, and reporting sections of the bill a commitment to come back at stage three um, already, and I don't know whether this particular section would be better uh, considered alongside other uh, reporting and review mechanisms. But again, interested to hear uh, the, ar the arguments the Minister makes. Okay. Yep. Um, very, very briefly, um, Convener, I just wanted to speak in support of Amendment 100 from Daniel Johnson. Um, and, and, and I think, if anything, this will strengthen this piece of, piece of um, legislation because one of the things we hear frequently um, as, as committee members, and I'm sure across every single committee, um, something that all members hear is the, is the lack of data and the lack of information. And this will strengthen this bill because it will give us the information we need to make sure that we have the correct support mechanisms in place and the correct places in place to keep, um, to keep children safe. So I'm fully supportive of this amendment. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think we do need to be gathering this information. I do agree with what Oliver Mundell said, however, about the use of the term legalised police cell, which the Minister referred to in the previous amendment. So, um, yeah, just to, to ask as well if that um, ha has any implications to this amendment and how it sits, and also about the reporting coming back at stage three, how that would work as well. Okay, um, Minister. So, thank you. Um, the committee already noticed its concern uh, that there's currently no requirement to monitor the use of place of safety power in section 23 of the bill. And in recommendation um, 298 of its stage one report, the committee asked the Scottish Government to amend the bill and make provision for data about the use of the power to be recorded in such a way to allow appropriate analysis. And I acknowledged in my response to the committee stage one response um, that the need for the, the that there was a need for the use of this power to be monitored and evaluated. Um, Daniel Johnson's amendment links, links to Alec Cole Hamilton's amendments on the place of safety powers. Therefore, I believe it would be unhelpful if Mr Johnson's amendment uh, was to proceed, and I hope he will not press it. But he's quite right for us to have this debate, I would say. It's important that we have appropriate data about the use of this power. I've already acknowledged the need for the bill to have provisions which allow much wider monitoring, as uh, Oliver Mundell said, review and reporting of its measures and their operation. And I've already undertaken to bring forward a suitable amendment in this regard at stage three. And if Mr Johnson agrees to withdraw Amendment 100, I give my firm commitment to address this matter in such an amendment and work with him and the committee on that. If he insists upon it being pressed, I would hope that the committee wouldn't support it and allow me to bring forward an appropriate amendment at stage three. Amendment 100 also requires um, the reasons for the use of the place of safety power in each case to be included in the report, which would be laid before Parliament and would be a public document. Given what I've already said about the importance of um, not revealing information about individual cases, I have serious concerns about whether it might be possible for some members of the public to link these details to an individual child, and I think we'd all agree that that would be very unhelpful. So while I understand the intentions behind Daniel Johnson's amendment for the reasons I've just set out, I cannot support Amendment 100 as it's currently drafted. I would ask Daniel Johnson to withdraw Amendment 100 if he agrees to Draw, withdraw with Amendment 100. I give my firm commitment to address this matter in such an amendment and to work with him and the committee on that. If he insists on it being pressed, I would hope the committee wouldn't support it and allow me to bring forward an appropriate amendment at stage three. Okay, Daniel Johnston to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 100. Well, I, I mean, I, I hear the, the concerns that have been laid out. I mean, in, in the first regard, I think as regards the, 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 the technical point around the terminology of, of uh, legalised police, I mean, I believe that that is something that could be tidied up in stage three. Um, as it stands, it would still uh, have um, 
some use, but there are, this is a technical definition that's come from the clerks. These, these cells do exist, and really what this would be a point is about making sure that that, that definition captured the full range of police cells as is, I think, intended and has been discussed. As regards the, the, the other issues, and there are a broad range of uh, data that is collected that can potentially, or in, if it was in, interpreted and implemented in such a way, potentially reveal individual details. In those other regards, we have ways of categorizing those and wrapping those up in categories in such a way that those individual details are not uh, revealed. I don't believe it's beyond uh, the wit of the, the Scottish Government in order to come up with such a data uh, collection and reporting uh, 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 mechanism. And indeed, um, uh, the data protection laws um, uh, are, are, are in place and this does nothing um, to, to overturn that. So for those reasons, I believe that this amendment is important in the absence of uh, any other proposals in front of us. If the government did come forward with alternative proposals, it would be perfectly possible for my uh, amendment to be overturned, and I would accept that at that point. But in the absence of any uh, uh, alternative proposals in front of us, I'm going to press my amendment. The question is that Amendment 100 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? committee is not agreed. Um, there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 100 to raise their hands? And those against the amendment? And any abstentions? The result of the division is for the Amendment 2. Against the Amendment 3, there were two abstentions. The Amendment falls. I call Amendment 27 in the name of Alec Cole-Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole-Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Alec Cole-Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole-Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 29 in the name of Alec Cole-Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole-Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Alec Cole-Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 22. Not moved. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Alec Cole-Hamilton. Alec Cole-Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 30 in the name of Alec Cole-Hamilton. Alec Cole-Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 33 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. <clears throat> the question is that Section 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> the, que <laughs> the question is that sections 27 to 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. I call Amendment 124 in the name of Gail Ross, grouped with Amendments 125, 127, 128 and 129. I would point out that if Amendment 127 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 35 and 34 in group further increase in the age of criminal responsibility and of prosecution, age and time scales for increase. Gail Ross to move Amendment 124 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. And um, in putting forward these amendments, I'm conscious that every day across Scotland, police officers play an important role in keeping our children and our young people safe, including those who often because of their own adverse childhood experiences can unfortunately become involved in harmful and occasionally serious harmful behaviour. It is police officers who can be the first point of contact out of hours when other professionals are not available, whose engagement with vulnerable children and young people is about initiating conversations and encouraging them to desist from immediately potentially harmful situations, and in the longer term, encouraging different choices to be made, helping to bring children into contact with other agencies and professionals, and helping to divert them into more positive choices. 
I would hope that we can all agree on the committee that it is important that this work and these conversations can continue with children below the age of criminal responsibility, particularly where there are concerns about potential involvement in a serious incident. And the changes my amendment makes to section 31 are designed to ensure that police officers working in their communities to keep children and everyone else safe can be confident that they can still have such conversations. But it does still remain the case that where a child is believed to have been involved in a serious harmful behaviour, as set out in Amendment 124, an investigative interview can only be conducted with a child interview order, where, for example, there has been a loss of life. And if the Minister's amendments are then accepted, where a child and a parent have agreed to an investigative interview, and that's what Amendment 125 seeks to make clearer. My amendments are therefore designed to make it absolutely clear that the police may ask a child under 12 questions in relation to a serious incident at any time prior to the constable reasonably suspecting that it was the child who carried out the harmful behaviour. And I think it provides an appropriate and proportionate approach which will ensure that children are not unnecessarily being caught up in a formal process, which, as we've heard, can be quite traumatising, but allows the police to carry out their functions and does not place undue burden on resources. So I hope the committee will support Amendments 124, 125 and 127. Turning now to the Minister's Amendments 128 and 129, um, my understanding is that both of these amendments seek to provide clarity and ensure further safeguards for children. Um, I hope that is the case and I welcome this, but I will look forward to the Minister explaining that further. Thank you. Minister to speak to Amendment 128 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, amendment 128 is a technical amendment designed to remove an apparent contradiction between the definition of an investigative interview contained at section 31 and the terms of section 36.2 of the bill. It clarifies that the police planning of an investigation, investigative interview should always involve <coughs> the relevant local authority rather than allowing it to be planned solely by the constable. I know the, that the committee will welcome that clarity on the policy intention. Similarly, Amendment 129 seeks to provide greater clarity on the provisions about conducting an investigative interview. The purpose is to close a potential loophole that would allow the police to plan an interview and then ask a social worker to question the child below the age of criminal responsibility, thus avoiding restrictions on police questioning of child below the age of criminal responsibility contained in Section 1. Given that the policy intention behind these amendments is to provide greater clarification, I would hope that the committee will support them. Gail Ross's amendments 124, 125 and 127 are also in this vein of seeking to provide more clarity. It's important that the bill is unambiguous and that the bill's measures are implemented in a way which limits when children may be brought into contact with authorities, but which also provides clarity for police officers that they can continue to engage with children to help keep them safe and to initiate initial conversations to try to establish if an incident of serious harm involving a child under the age of criminal responsibility has taken place. In every aspect of this bill, we should be seeking to give agencies and professionals confidence about how to act when the age is raised, what we continue to expect of them in their engagement of, with children and young people, and crucially, do all we can to limit the circumstances in which children will be expected to engage with formal process of investigation. I hope that the committee will support Gail Ross's amendments. Okay, if any other members wish to come in? <coughs> Thanks, Convener. Um, I think this uh, amendment is brought forward by Gail Ross and the Minister are, are good amendments. Um, there's a lot of good work going on in our communities uh, by police officers. I um, had a good example uh, the, the, the other day, actually, um, driving by a, a large group of young people with a couple of community police officers, and they all seemed to be having a really good chat, and it was um, it was very uh, jovial. And I, I think that uh, we want to uh, be allow our officers to continue that work, and I think these amendments allow those conversations to continue to happen. Okay, thank you. Gail Ross to wind up and press or withdraw your amendments. Um, I think everything that has uh, been said, so I will press. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 124 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 125 in the name of Gail Ross, already debated with Amendment 124. Gail Ross to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 125 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I 
call Amendment 126 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 126 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Moved. Um, Oh, I've, I've no more to say. Oh. Excuse us. Group four. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that was accepted without a vote. Okay, it's fine. Thank you. Sorry, just a confused. Apologies myself. that they were confusing things here. So you're moving Amendment 126. We've Thank you. spoken to it. Apologies. Okay, the question is that Amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Apologies. Just one second. I think I've, I've become confused with the That's not debated yet. Process. 126 has to be debated now. We have to debate. 126. I hadn't appreciated that the last amendment passed without a vote. Sorry. Was that? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. I think what we'll do is we'll suspend briefly and organise ourselves. Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, welcome back. I call Amendment 126 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 126 and speak to all amendments in the group. Okay. Thank you. Convener, this group of amendments create additional measures which would allow investigative interview by agreement. I want to assure the committee that I've given very careful consideration to this and my overarching aim with this legislation is to ensure that we are doing all we can to raise the age of criminal responsibility in principle and in practice and that where we still need um, to investigate serious harmful behaviour, we do so in a way that puts the child's needs and interests at the centre of that process. The legislation currently provides for a detailed formal process to be adhered to in order to investigate and interview a child suspected of being involved in serious harmful behaviour. This option would still be available. This group of amendments sets out how such an interview might take place if both the child and at least one of the child's parents agree to such an interview. View. And that would be consistent with the advisory group's recommendation that in the most serious circumstances it's important to provide the child with the opportunity to provide their account of events and to identify all relevant risks and needs. A power should be created to allow for the interview of children which, with appropriate safeguards, including where the support of a parent or carer is not forthcoming. Those safeguards should be based on the principles of child protection procedures and joint investigative interviews. There are very sound uh, reasons to allow for interviews to proceed if the child and their parent agree to them. A child who is involved in harmful behaviour is very likely to be traumatised by that. A formal process involving court proceedings might increase that trauma. Research also tells us that when a child suffers any kind of distress, early intervention is helpful in promoting understanding and allowing the focus to turn to restorative action. Given that these events in these serious cases may well have already caused the child significant trauma, having this route available could be very beneficial to them. Where agreements clearly established then, these amendments facilitate a less cumbersome approach, enabling the child to move readily to tell their story in an appropriately supportive setting without the need for a court process first. This will be helpful in understanding what happened and informing the next steps in addressing any harmful behaviour as soon as possible. It could also um, prevent the additional stress associated with a formal court order process um, being placed upon the child and their family. Of course, the safeguards provided through sections 36 to 42 in relation to the planning and conduct of interviews would still apply whichever route is taken. So turning to the amendments, Amendment 130 clarifies the limited circumstances in which an investigative interview by agreement should be undertaken and that, crucially, both the child and parents must agree. It then seeks to provide for details around the withdrawal of agreement, either the child or, or their parent. 
Amendment 131 places an obs obligation on the police to provide a range of information to the child and parent following their agreement to an investigative interview and to provide a copy of the written information to the advocacy worker as soon as is reasonably practicable. This provision seeks to ensure that where the agreement's given, the child and their parent understand what the agreement does and they have the information um, setting out what they've agreed to. Amendment 138 clarifies that a child has the right not to answer questions, irrespective of whether the interview is conducted by, the agree by a agreement or a under a child interview order. Amendments 143 and 144, respectively, provide further clarification that in the case of an interview by agreement, the supporter in that interview must be the parent who gave their agreement. And if the person conducting the interview doesn't consider them to be an appropriate person, then that agreement's withdrawn. Amendment 158 tidies up the layout of provisions. Amendment 159 then provides for the guidance to cover the obtaining and withdrawal of agreement relating to investigative interviews. The other amendments are all consequential in various ways on the introduction of interviews by agreement. Taken together, these amendments enable an additional approach to carrying out interviews to investigate serious harmful behaviour. The key aim is to benefit children by providing for a process by agreement with important safeguards to protect and promote their interests and rights in such a process. I urge the committee to support the amendments. Do any committee members wish to speak to this amendment? Okay. Minister, to formally wind up. Yep. Um, that's fine. Okay. The question is that Amendment 126 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 127 in the name of Gail Ross, already debated with Amendment 124. If Amendment 127 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 35 and 34. Gail Ross to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 127 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 128 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 124. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 128 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 129 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 124. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 129 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <clears throat> The question is that section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call amendment 130 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 126. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that amendment 130 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 131 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 126. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 131 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Sections 32 and 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 36 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that Section 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. I call Amendments 132, 133, 134, 135 and 136 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Can I invite the Minister to move Amendments 132 to 136 on block? Moved on block. Do any members object to a single question being put on Amendments 132 to 136? Yeah. The question is that Amendments 132 to 136 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
call Amendment 137 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 126. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 137 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 138 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 126. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 138 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <clears throat> I call Amendment 64 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton in a group of its own. Alec Cole Hamilton to move and speak to Amendment 64, please. Thank you, convener. It may seem like a semantic point to um, to extend the existing <coughs> section on the right not to answer questions to a right to silence, um, but I do so for several reasons in Amendment 64, which I move in my name. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, we had a lot of discussion around this at stage one. A number of stakeholders suggested that they would like to see an equalisation of rights between uh, children who are being interviewed in a, a formal context and adults, and that this amendment does exactly that. Um, put simply, the difference between a right to silence and a right not to answer questions is, tell me what happened, is a, an instruction, it is not a question, and uh, interpreta interpretation is very important in any legislation, and this is how that might be be interpreted so. Similarly, the Minister, in her last comment, speaking to the last set of amendments she moved, referenced the fact that these interviews happened at times of great trauma, that uh, there may well be in the, the midst of an uh, adverse childhood experience. And we know uh, there is much empirical evidence to say that, um, that distilling in granular detail uh, the retelling of events can have the effect of re-traumatising children and young people. Um, this simplifies things to be on an equal footing with adult rights in a similar situation and extends this right not to answer questions to a uh, right to silence, which I believe carries the support of stakeholders who we um, inter interviewed at stage one and I think is, uh, goes away to making this act all the more progressive. So I move the amendments. Okay, thank you. Do any other members wish to speak? Minister. So I've listened very carefully to the concerns about this and I've tried to be clear during stage one on, on it and why I think this amendment 64 to change the language is unhelpful and also unnecessary. The right not to answer questions in section 38 has the same meaning and effect as the right to silence and I wish to be absolutely clear that we're not watering down children's rights here. The intention behind the wording is to remove the language of criminal law. We're removing these children from the criminal justice system and the language which is used by the police who come into contact with these children should reflect that. Uh, we don't want to increase the anxiety and distress of children who've already experienced a large amount of trauma before they find themselves in this situation. We want them to be engaged with as children, which is what sections 35, 36 and 42 and Amendment 131 and the previous group already deliver in requiring information to be provided in a way that's appropriate to the child's age and maturity at different points in the interview process. There are also technical issues with Amendment 64. It refers to Section 34 of the Criminal Justice Act in 2016, which applies only where a person has been arrested and is in police custody. Neither condition will be met for a child under the age of criminal responsibility. I hope that explains why the wording in Section 38 drafted as it is, it is drafted as it is, and why this amendment is neither helpful nor necessary. And accordingly, I hope that Mr Mo Cole Hamilton might withdraw his amendment. Throughout the development of this law, we have sought not just to technically decriminalise children, but to entirely change their experience of contact with the criminal justice system and to de decriminalise them in practice as well. And I believe that introducing the language rather than the plain English child appropriate version is a retrograde step. I believe it will provoke behavioural responses in those involved which will effectively recriminalise children. If Mr Cole Hamilton insists on pressing it, I appreciate that some members of the committee may feel very strongly about this. If the committee wishes to vote for this amendment, then I'll accept that decision reluctantly and I will consider whether an amendment is required at stage three to make it technically sound. However, I for one am not comfortable with an amendment which set, inserts language from the criminal law into a bill which decriminalises children, which this bill 
that has been the aim, to look at children under the age of criminal responsibility. Yeah? I just wonder whether the Minister would reflect on the fact that you know, there's a big difference between removing uh, criminal provisions that are punitive to children and removing uh, matters of criminal procedure that are long established in the Scottish legal system you know, and, might, and might make children feel more able to exercise their rights. Does she see that there's a, is a, is a distinction? I know it's cl perhaps clumsy in, in, in the wording, but does she see there's a, is a distinction between those two things? I mean, I think I've made clear what my views are, but I'm comfortable with the committee making a decision on this. I, for one, would um, say that we need to always be looking at these children through a well-being lens, not a criminal lens. I, mean, I, I, I think she makes the point well that this is about language, and she's right, but I also think she's a, a mischaracterization of where this language is important. You know, the, the right to silence isn't a matter purely of, of criminal law. It's actually a fundamental point of human rights. And actually what is important here is that we embed human rights right the way through laws. Indeed, I think the Scottish Government accepts. And I think the right to silence is one that is well understood by, uh, you know, throughout society and is not just purely a matter of criminal law. Therefore, I think by using different language, she, I think we run the risk of creating confusion as to the distinction between the right to silence in this situation and in others. And I was just wondering if the Minister might reflect on that point. I, I mean, I'm, as I said, I disagree with this amendment, but I'm content for the committee to make its own decision. I'll call Hamilton to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 64. Thank you, Thank you Convener. I, I hear what the, um, the Minister says about wanting to remove any semblance of criminality from this bill for children. But if that was truly the intent of the, the government in this, then we would have outlawed the use of cells, because I think that is far more criminalising than the form of words that we use to communicate the rights of a, a, a person in an interview. Um, similarly, if we wanted to remove criminalisation of children, we would listen to the United Nations and, and lift it beyond 12, or, or the uh, European Council for that matter. Um, Language is important. I absolutely accept that. Language, language is especially important in terms of procedures like this. But when we talk about um, extending language that is found in adult criminal law to children, we're not talking about reading children uh, effectively their Miranda rights or whatever that's called in, in Scotland. This is about um, re-establishing a power, uh, addressing a power imbalance uh, whereby children feel um, in that moment of heat and trauma um, that they really have to do what they're told. Um, whereas this assures to them um, that they have rights themselves. And I think that, as Dan very eloquently said, um, the right to silence is integral to the human rights within our justice system. And that should apply to children as it should apply to adults. So I wish to move my amendment. Question is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Yeah. No. Committee's not agreed, so there'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 64 to raise their hands, please? those against the amendment? And the result of the division is for the amendment four, against the amendment three, and the amendment carries. I call amendment 139 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 126. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendments 140, 141, 142, 143 and 144, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 140, We'll just suspend briefly again.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. We should be um, back on track. Can I call Amendment 140 already debated? The question is that Amendment 140 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 141 already debated. The question is that Amendment 141 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 142 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 147 and 153. Minister to move Amendment 142 and speak to all amendments in the group. Just one second. Excuse me. Not at all. Convener. Amendment 153 is the substantive amendment in this group and seeks to address concerns that section 41, as currently drafted, could be interpreted to mean that both the supporter and the advocacy worker need to be present in the room when a child is being interviewed. While section 39, 4 and 45 will ensure that the supporter and advocacy worker will certainly not be denied access to the child at any time during the interview, it's sometimes not in the interests of the child for both to be present in the room. For example, a child may wish to be open about the circumstances surrounding um, an incident involving sexual behaviour, um, but not comfortable in doing so with their parent in the room. It's also important that, to ensure that the legislation allows for this flexibility and for children to be supported to take part in an interview to meet their needs and interests. Amendment 153 therefore makes it absolutely clear in the face of a bill that a child, a child can only be interviewed as long as both their supporter and the advocacy worker are in attendance at the location of the interview, but that the presence of one or other in the room where the interview is being conducted is sufficient. Amendments 142 and 147 simply make the technical changes which flow from Amendment 153 to ensure consistency throughout the bill. And I would urge the committee to support these amendments. Thank you. Do any other members wish to contribute? Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, convener. I was just interested um, to ask the minister, obviously, with a child under the age of 12, uh, what, what the sort of mechanism would be for deciding which one of those two people uh, you know, wouldn't be there and, and what the, the sort of parental rights, for example, would be um, you know, if, a, if a parent was concerned about their child being in with, with just the, the advocacy worker, for example. Um, and just how that, if you know, if there was a dispute or a, a concern, how that would be sorted out. It was, but it's not. Um, I, I understand the, the principle. It just what would what would happen in, in practice and in that sort of circumstance. Certainly, um, the the child, the parent would never be denied access to the child. Um, we need to discuss, and we certainly am open to discussing um, how we develop the guidance around this issue. Um, but I've set out in my opening remarks why it's sometimes just not in the interest of the child um, for both of the supporter and the advocacy worker to be present in the room. And what's important here is that the child is able to give their version of events in a, in a way that puts them at ease. Um, so I would hope that you would accept that that's the intention of it. It's just working out who, who would be deciding what was in the child's best interest, because I think at the moment this kind of general idea in, in, in Scots law, not just criminal law, is that you know a child under the age of 12 you know, might not always in all circumstances be able to, to weigh up and make those decisions. So it's just who would be deciding in those circumstances. As I said, we're going to make, we'll make that um, clear and guidance um, who makes the decision and what factors are to be considered, but the um, voice of the child is very important in this. Okay, thank you. Do any other members wish to come in? No. Minister to wind up and press her withdrawal the amendment. Um, I hope that the whole committee would agree with me um, on this amendment and support these amendments 142, 147 and 153. Okay, the question is that Amendment 142 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I call Amendment 143 already debated. The question is that 143 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 144 already debated. The question is that Amendment 144 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call amendments 145, 146, 147, 148, 
149 and 150, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and invite the Minister to move amendments 145 to 150 on block. Moved on block. Do any members object to a single question being put? No. The question is that amendments 145 to 150 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? I call amendments 151, 152 and 153, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. Invite the Minister to move amendments 151 to 153 on block. Moved. Do any members object to a single question being put? question is that amendments 151 to 153 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call amendments 154, 155, 156 and 157, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 154 to 157 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put? No. The question is that amendments 154 to 157 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? The question is that section 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? I call amendment 158 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 126. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 158 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 38 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 41 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 40 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yep. The question is that Section 45 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 159 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 126. Minister to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 159 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. I call Amendment 160 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 126. Minister to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 160 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that section 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. agreed? I call amendment 43 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move, convener. I call amendment 42 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 45 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 44 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 161 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 162 and 163. Minister to move Amendment 161 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Convener, it's important that our legislation to raise the age of criminal responsibility does all it can to safeguard the interests and rights of children. Section 47 of the bill sets out the circumstances in which the police can take a sample and makes clear that the limits and requirements under Section 52, Section 57 um, or any other enactment applies. 
It makes clear that these requirements do not apply where a child is a victim of, a, of an offence or seriously harmful behaviour. Amendment 161 seeks to clarify the use which can be made of samples um, taken from a child under the age of criminal responsibility on the basis that they are a victim of an offence or of seriously harmful behaviour by another child. Amendment 161 clarifies that a sample taken from a child under the age of 12 on the basis that they are thought to be a victim <coughs> cannot be used for the purposes of investigating any suspected harmful, serious harmful behaviour by that child. Amendment 161 further allows for the use of that sample if a child is agreed that a sample can be taken previously, can be used to investigate an incident where the child is now 12 years of age or older. This amendment doesn't affect the ability of the police to apply for a Section 52 order or, in urgent cases, to use the emergency power in Section 57 to obtain a new sample. Section 55 of the Bill provides for destruction of samples taken under Section 52, which applies to children under the age of criminal responsibility. However, Section 55 doesn't currently specify what should happen to samples that were taken under the authority of a Section 52 order, which is appealed. The purpose of Amendment 162 is therefore to specify that if the appeal is successful and the Section 52 order is either quashed or altered, meaning that any of the samples originally taken would no longer be authorised, then those samples and all information associated with them must be destroyed as soon as possible. That prevents authorities from keeping hold of samples in these circumstances of children under the age of criminal responsibility. Amendment 162 enables samples obtained before the appeal is lodged or before the police are informed of it to be retained until the outcome of the appeal is known, although no use can be made of them until the appeal is decided. This in turn means that the sample could then be used for the purposes of the investigation if the, if the appeal is um, unsuccessful and thereafter destroyed in accordance with section 55 or the new section inserted by amendment 163 which I will talk to um, shortly. Crucially that avoids the need for a sample to be taken from the child twice if there's an appeal against the order but this then proves unsuccessful. Again the amendment seeks to make clear the process to be followed and to ensure that the interests of the child are at the core of that process. Section 48.1b of the Bill already provides that samples may be taken with consent from a child aged 12 or over in relation to suspected seriously harmful behaviour by that child when aged under 12. However, at present, the Bill doesn't provide for the destruction of samples taken on this basis. Amendment 163 applies the same requirements for destruction as are contained in Section 55 to these cases, that is, the samples and all information derived from them will be destroyed if a decision isn't made. Um, if a decision is made not to pass information to the principal reporter about the case, or following conclusion of a children's hearing proceedings in connection with the case. As I mentioned, um, they're technical, but they're very important um, amendments, and it's. Um, I think they need to be done. <coughs> I'm happy to you know, go into more, more detail if required, but I think these measures um, are important um, to protect children's rights. Thank you. Do any other members wish to say anything on these amendments? Okay, Minister, to wind up. Press. Um, thank you. I think, as I said, these are important um, to protect the amendments designed to protect the rights of the child by clearly setting out the processes for retention and disposal requirements. And I would hope that the whole committee would support me and support the amendments. The question is that Amendment 161 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Call Amendment 47 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move, convener. Call Amendment 46 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 49 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 48 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The 
question is that sections 49 to 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 162 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 161. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. Question is that Amendment 162 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that sections 57 and 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. I call Amendment 163 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 161. Minister, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 163 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Sections 59 and 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Call Amendment 51 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 50 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 53 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 52 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 55 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 54 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. Call Amendment 57 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. And call Amendment 56 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 164 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 126. Minister to move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 164 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? question is that section 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay, and at this point we'll suspend briefly um, to change officials for the Minister. Okay, welcome back. Can I call Amendment 119 in the name of Mary Fee in a group of its own? Mary Fee to move and speak to Amendment 119, please. Well, thank you, um, Convener. I submitted this um, amendment following the evidence we received while scrutinising this legislation, both here in committee and through the written evidence we, that we have received. We heard evidence from a number of experts who discussed the different stages of child and young adult development. And psychologists argue that the part of the brain that focuses on rationality does not fully develop until young adults are in their late teens or early 20s. In other words, whilst all children develop simultaneously, they develop at different rates. And this means that children will each have a different age of capacity for understanding the consequences of their actions. And capacity is usually understood to have a cognitive and a cognitive component, which translates to the need to prove, firstly, the presence of an understanding of wrongfulness, and secondly, an ability to control one's behaviour in accordance with such an understanding. And the Law Commission takes the view that anyone who completely lacks criminal capacity should not be found criminally responsible. And it draws out three particular capacities needed for the fair imposition of responsibility. The ability to rationally form a judgment, the ability to understand wrongfulness and the ability to control one's physical actions. 
Children and young people may not be able to conform to some or all of these requirements because of immaturity, and it's in such, such situations that my proposed amendment could be used. In order to assess if the child has full capacity, a report must be obtained from an approved medical practitioner or psychologist. And this assessment would provide further information for both the courts and the children's hearing system when determining what course of action to take when dealing with a young person. And if we are serious about dealing with young people from a compassionate perspective and providing them with the support they need to move on from the acts they may or may not have committed, it's important that we fully understand their capacity to understand the consequences of their actions. And I understand that there may be nervousness about using the term diminished responsibility. And my amendment seeks to differentiate between abnormality of the mind and developmental immaturity. However, we have a duty to ensure that children who are developmentally immature and do not have the capacity to understand the consequences of their actions are supported. And I move the amendment in my name and I would urge the committee to support it. Thank you. Any other members wish to come in? Alec Hamilton. No, thank you, convener. Yeah, I'd like to offer my support to the amendment in the name of Mary Fee. I think this, uh, given that uh, amendments in my name have fallen previously to increase age of criminal responsibility, this does uh, strengthen this bill in terms of uh, a progressive angle and recognises that uh, children may have a range of things um, going on in their lives which can contribute to their actions beyond their control sometimes. I think this also speaks to those uh, arguments we've had already about equalising the rights of children and the rights of adults. If you had an adult suspect who was on trial who had a mental age of 14, they would be uh, dealt with differently than a, a, an adult with an age, a mental age of that of their peers. Um, I think we also recognise that there is a science to this, that um, adverse childhood experiences, which we have heard um, at great detail <coughs> in stage one as being responsible for the um, offending or harmful behaviour as a, a reaction to um, adverse childhood experiences, those ACEs can actually alter child brains at a molecular and genetic level in terms of the uh, ability to process joy and understanding and, uh, and indeed intellect. Um, so for that reason, I think it's a vital tool that if we're not going to, uh, if we're still going to deal with 13-year-olds, uh, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds in the children's hearing system um, on a, an offending basis and potentially give them cr criminal records, I think it's vital in terms of equalising their rights that we recognise that they may have diminished responsibility as a result of, uh, of their own mental capacity. So I support amend amendments in Mary Fee's name. Fulton McGregor. You know, um, you know, I, I've actually got um, quite serious uh, reservations about this amendment. Um, I, I can I can see where uh, Mary Fee um, and Alex Cole Hamilton are coming from in the way that they've approached this whole bill in terms of a, a, um, a, a progressive approach, uh, uh, to, use, to use Alex's words. But I actually think that this amendment is a retrograde step. Um, and I say that for a few reasons. Currently, um, if any child that... Uh, that presents to the children's hearing system, the reporter would, would issue a report to social work. Part of that, there's a specific section uh, on health, and um, part of that is, is, is a judgment then about what health services are asked um, are asked for information. Not every child would, ha would need direct psychological um, support or have that input. The reporter can also make that request. I also think that um, I've got real concerns over a psychological assessment being used um, in every instance because, as Alex Cole-Hamilton rightly pointed out, the vast majority, if not all, children who become involved in offending behaviour, um, to call it that, or, or harmful behaviour, um, are likely to be traumatised. And this whole psychological assessment process in itself has the potential, I think, to re-traumatise. Re and, you know, using my, my, my previous experience as a social worker, even the introduction uh, of, of psychological input had to be managed very, very carefully with young people. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm grateful to Fulton McGregor for taking an intervention. Does he agree with me, though, that, um, that if we're to get to the proper comprehensive suite of interventions for which the children's hearing system in Scotland is rightly celebrated um, to uh, a young person who's exhibiting harmful behaviour, that we actually understand the f need to understand the full picture of what's going on with that child? And uh, an understanding of mental capacity is absolutely part of that. Yep. 
I, I mean, I, I know where you're coming from with this, but I, I don't think that this amendment has the effect, that it will have the effect that you're looking for. And I'm not sure, I mean, we didn't take any <coughs> evidence on it as such, but uh, I mean, a lot of the, the children's organisations who, um, you know, have been supportive of, of some of the stuff that you, you've put forward, I am not sure uh, what they would think about a standardised psychological assessment in this. And I, I think that I would request if Mary Fee doesn't uh, press our button that, that gives the Minister, I, I don't, the Minister's obviously going to serve, gives us some time to bring something back that can perhaps be a compromised position, but I have got serious uh, concerns about this amendment and I won't be supporting okay. it. A couple of members want to come in. Gail Ross, then Oliver Mundell. Yeah, two things. I mean, maybe the Minister will outline um, what is, what actually happens <coughs> at the present moment with um, the, the children's hearing system and, and what Fulton McGregor was saying that um, if it is deemed to be necessary then these assessments are routinely carried out and the whole child um, circumstance I believe is already being taken into account so I would hope that these powers are already there but not making it a necessity to have every single child psychologically assessed. I also have concerns about the use of the term diminished responsibility because as far as I'm aware, that's a special defence in criminal law for the crimes of murder or um, culpable homicide. So I just wondered about the language around that as well. Okay, Oliver Mundell. Um, I hear the points uh, Gail Ross is making around the, the language. And um, again, there may be other things that are not perfect with the amendment as drafted. Uh, but I would uh, support Mary Fee in, in pressing this amendment because I think it will focus uh, the Minds Ministers to try and uh, come up with a substantive amendment um, in this area um, at stage three. I think this is a practical uh, step uh, that is about looking at the full facts and circumstances. And I think that often, uh, although professionals or other people who are, are, are trying their best and uh, I, I think are very often uh, you know, looking to, to the best interests of the child, I think either having... Uh, you know, a, a system where this is required or uh, where it can be re sort of requested um, and then delivered on or, 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 or sort of wishes of the child or the representatives as an automatic right it is, is important and I think it will help um, make sure <laughs> uh, that again when it comes to, to, to disposal or, or how uh, individual cases are being handled that, that, we, that we find the right solution um, and I think often uh, you know, as we know from, from evidence, we did get a little bit of evidence uh, around this area, around special defences mm -hmm. um, and around mm -hmm. um, the, the previous situation in England where there was a defence of infancy there. Uh, you know, the, the, there, was, there was some evidence. I, I, I think it is an area that's, that's worth exploring. Um, and I, I, I think, I, you know, I, I, I think it, it is about children's rights fundamentally. Okay, Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I have some grave concerns about Amendment 119, which um, conflates the plea of diminished responsibility in criminal proceedings with the broader concept of developmental immaturity. It's therefore important to say up front um, that this amendment can't be supported on account of it creating a new definition for a concept which is very narrowly defined in Scots criminal law at the moment and would create um, great uncertainty in law. This amendment seeks to introduce a new section on diminished responsibility, and diminished responsibility is defined in statute and only available as a plea to a charge of murder, reducing the charge to one of culpable homicide. The amendment seeks to expand the presently available plea used in criminal proceedings Scotland and making it applicable to all cases in the children's hearing system. Um, and expanding on its understood definition and use in our legal system by including developmental immaturity. It appears to describe diminished responsibility as a condition of either abnormality of the mind or of developmental immaturity. In Scots law, this plea can only be used in circumstances where the following criteria have been established. There's been an aberration or weakness of mind. There must be some form of mental unsoundness. There must be a state of mind which is bordering on, though not amounting to insanity. There must be a mind so affected... Do, does uh, the Minister not recognise that by putting uh, the, the further uh, specifications into statute, it is just a case of expanding that defence, saying that there's an existing defence, yeah. doesn't really mean that an offence, a, a defence can't be changed or expanded and 
obviously Scots, uh, Scots law in this area has expanded and changed over the centuries and um, my understanding is that diminished responsibility was a, a common law defence before it was one in, in statute. And so statute's already defined and changed what diminished responsibility is. Okay, the, the defence of diminished responsibility is only used in the situation of murder and I think it's unhelpful to introduce it in this case. These children are not charged. Children under the age of 12, we're all agreed there's a bright line. Those children are not held criminally responsible. This, this wouldn't hold them criminally responsible. In fact, it would, would potentially allow uh, for their actions to be to be fully fully explained and, and, and properly understood, so that uh, 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 the best uh, assessment could be made. I think it's unhelpful to to, to, to mix the two things. I think it's mischaracterising. I agree. I think it's I agree. mischaracterising uh, what the uh, MP is trying to do. Can, can I just ask everyone to speak through the chair? I know there's a lot of debate to be had, but let's just speak through the chair, please. I agree that it's unhelpful to mix um, the two categories, but I think that that amendment does that. These factors um, that we are discussing here today at this committee are not the same. Um, the, the factors relating to diminished responsibility, as it's defined in Scots law, are not the same as a more general concern to ensure that the maturity and development of children is understood and taken account of when we're thinking about how best to respond to an incident of harmful behaviour um, which meets their needs. I think it's, it's dip, deeply unhelpful to conflate the two. I do sympathise, of course, uh, with what I think is the intention behind the amendment, which is to ensure that all of the children who come into contact with the hearing system have their specific needs and, uh, understood and addressed. And when that doesn't happen, it absolutely is a failing of our systems. But I don't think that this amendment is a way to address it. The amendment requires that a psychological assessment has to be carried out in all cases regardless of the ground, so uh, whether it be on account of the child's own offending behaviour or whether they themselves have been harmed against, that's absolutely not appropriate in all cases. A psychological assessment, as um, already alluded to, could potentially be a damaging experience for that child, forcing the child to immediately confront their acts in order to analyse their capacity to understand the consequences. It's also very likely to uh, result in unnecessary delays, which will only serve to increase the distress and anxiety of that child. The Solicitor General, in her stage two evidence, made the point that children are different and need to be looked at as individuals in individual circumstances. She said it depends on the background, the circumstances of the child. I absolutely agree with the law officers on this point. I think a universal psychological assessment of every child in the hearing system would simply be more damaging than beneficial. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving away. Um, I, I heard that evidence uh, from the Solicitor General as well. And, and I think, though, that what she was asking to, uh, uh, us to do was to get a picture in the round of every child that comes before the Children's Hearings Panel. And I think that mental capacity and uh, their, their judgment and their sort of age of maturity should be part of that picture. And it will be different for every child, but that's why we need to assess it. I think, I mean, I think we already do assess it. Um, I think there are cases where it's necessary, um, and the Children's Hearing Act 2011 provides that Children's Hearing can defer making a decision and make a medical examination order for the purpose of obtaining any further information or carry out further investigation that's needed before the subsequent Children's Hearing. And we also heard from the law officers at stage two that the Crown will carry out a psychological assessment in appropriate cases. And so I believe, um, to answer Gail Ross's question, that where this type of assessment is considered helpful, the facility already exists. I'd like to reassure the member on the broader issue of children's mental health. That a specific task force on this was launched in the summer of last year, and that was on the back of the Audit Scotland um, report on children and adolescent mental health services, which reported that a step change is required to improve children and young people's mental health. And that report indicated that there's a, a strong indication of a gap in services for children and young people who do not meet the criteria for the most specialist help. 
And to me, it's this unacceptable gap in how our public services respond to children and young people with additional support needs that the member is seeking to address through her amendment. And I'd like to reassure the, the member that this work has begun. There's a specific work stream within the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force looking at ask, at risk young people, including those young people who are involved in offending behaviour. And that group's expected to make um, recommendations to the task force on how at-risk people can receive improved access to mental health. Um, I would respectfully suggest that this amendment may not um, deliver what the member intends and it, and it would, and that specific concentrated work is underway already to address the gaps that currently exist for young people accessing appropriate specialist services. Now, my other concern with this amendment is uh, one which um, colleague, my colleague Fulton um, touched on already. It's the possibility for introducing this concept um, which might lead to entirely unintended consequences. So if, my concern is, if psychological testing can be used to show that older children are too um, developmentally immature to understand their con the consequences of their action, um, it could also potentially be used um, to establish that younger children are mature enough to do so. And that causes me really, really grave concern. It opens up the possibility of children under 12 being considered fit to stand trial. The amendment as drafted applies to all children. So those of any age, a three-year-old, for example, would fall within the scope of this amendment. It would apply for all grounds of referral, whether the decision is about the child's conduct or not at all. And the effect of that is unknowable, and with respect, as drafted, the purpose is unclear. The amendment currently doesn't give any clarity as to how that medical report would affect the outcomes of the hearing, nor indeed what the hearing is to do with the report. The amendment would suggest that it's possible for children of any age, no matter how young, to be assessed, as I said already, to of a, a sufficient maturity to determine or control their conduct. And it, it does appear to introduce an approach where children under the age of criminal responsibility could be assessed as having capacity to understand the consequences of their actions. So, so what then? To sum up, this amendment imports a concept from murder charges to a child centre process. It could undermine the key principle of decriminalisation of the bill and it obscures the clarity of approach and its meaning and intent are unclear, its consequences are unknowing, unknowable. We'd all wish to ensure that in taking decisions about children, the best information is available. If there are concerns regarding a child's understanding, developmental immaturity or mental health, it should absolutely absolutely be the case that the right information is available at the right time. Medicalising all children is not an appropriate response to these challenges. I am more than happy to sit down with Mary Fee and with my officials to tease out exactly what the intent of this amendment is and to seek to bring something back at stage three which delivers on that intent. Uh, however, at present, I would urge the member to withdraw this amendment and if she does not, I ask for the um, amendment to be resisted by the committee. Mary Fee to wind up and press or withdraw amendment 119, please. Um, thank you, um, convener. I, um, I've listened very carefully to, to all of the comments um, from my um, committee colleagues and, and from the minister. Um, can I say at the outset that I absolutely understand the concerns that have been raised by some members and um, by um, the minister? Um, but notwithstanding that, I, I still am of the belief that we need to put into place a system that fully supports the welfare approach that, that, that we are taking to, to all children. Um, and, and the minister made the point about the gap in mental health services. There is a gap in mental health services. Our young people are being failed by the, the mental health services that are available um, to them. And the very fact that there is an omission, that there is a, a failure and a gap in our mental health services, I believe, actually supports the inclusion of, of this um, amendment. 
I accept that social work assessments are, are, are carried out on, on children when they are going through um, the, the children's hearing system. And I don't, for any means, in, intend to diminish the, the importance of assessments that are done by um, social workers. They are not psychological assessments. They would not determine um, the behaviour and the capacity issues that I am trying to um, rectify with, with this amendment. All, all psychological assessments would be um, would be done. Um, the child would be at the centre of them. The age of the child um, would be taken into account, and there would be a child-centred approach to, to, to those assessments. They would not be a standard form of psychological assessment that would be done in the same format for every single child, regardless of, of their age. They would be tailored around that child. And this is about equalisation of, of rights. If we truly want to take a welfare-based approach to all of our children and, and fully use the powers that we have with, with GERFEC. And GERFEC is something that we talk about all the time. We have to get it right for every child. We have a responsibility as parliamentarians to make sure that we properly support all of our children. I think that, um, I think, I think uh, Mary Fee for taking the intervention, I think that the Minister made a, a good offer there for because, as I said earlier when I, when I spoke um, on your amendment earlier, I, I know what you're trying to achieve, I've, and I have to repeat again, using my previous experience in social work, real, real concerns that it will not achieve that. And I think the minister's offer to you to get something to achieve what you're what you're looking for at stage three would work. But I'm even trying to think, you know, just now, you, you know, our report comes in to social work, but the for the for the, um, to go back to the reporter, but now there would be if this if this was to pass now there would be a psychological assessment. What about if professionals are saying no, this child uh, is not suitable for a psychological assessment. This child has suffered far too much trauma. Where then does that leave the psychological assessment? I, I, I honestly have real real concerns about it, um, Marina. I hope you'll take the minister's <coughs> offer because I think you could probably find a way forward to get the effect that you want without the potentially damaging consequences. Thank thank you, and I. I appreciate the, um, the the member's intervention, but um, if you will allow me um, to continue, I mean, I, as I have said, I, I do have um, the greatest sympathy for the concerns that, that that you have raised. But I go back to the point that I made um, about taking that welfare-based approach, about using GERFEC, um, and and I would, in, in closing, convener, make the point that we are we are a guarantor of human rights. That's everyone's human rights. Doesn't matter what age they are. This Parliament has a responsibility to, to ensure that the human rights of every individual are protected. And this, this I'm, I'm just about to close, um, Minister, this amendment would assure, ensure that those human rights are taken into account. And I move the amendment in my name. The question is that Amendment 119 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We're not all agreed. There will be a division. Can I ask that those in favour of the amendment raise their hands now, please? Those against the amendment? <coughs> the result of the division is for the amendment four, against the amendment three. The amendment carries. And call amendment 120 in the name of Daniel Johnston in a group of its own. Daniel Johnston to move and speak to the amendment, please. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> I mean, I think at the heart of both this bill and indeed all the comments that we've heard uh, this morning and indeed uh, throughout the course of, of this bill from this committee, the importance of treating children uh, with the care and the respect that they need, upholding their rights is absolutely central. But I think at root, I think there is a consensus that we have a history in Scotland of uh, taking a progressive approach to the treatment of children, especially when they come into uh, contact with the authorities in the justice system. That is long established. It was in 1960 that Lord Kilbrandon convened his committee and his work to look at whether or not Scotland could take a different approach. It was in 1971 that the children's reporter uh, first convened and undertook their work. But my concern is this, is that both through this work and indeed the work that, that I've been involved with and on the committees, we do a, a large number of things which impact on uh, the work of the, the, the children's reporter, its effectiveness, and more importantly, the intent that was originally set out 
Baikal Brandon um, uh, 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 over 50 years ago. Uh, and so I think it is important, as important as it is to make uh, these changes to the law and our approach, that we also uh, take cognizance of the impact of uh, 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 that the, the, uh, these measures have, whether it's here uh, regarding the age of criminal responsibility or uh, the, the work that's currently being uh, undertaken by the Justice Committee looking at vulnerable witnesses, that we look at the impacts uh, that these measures have on the, the report system. Malcolm Schaeffer, in his evidence to the Justice Committee on, on uh, vulnerable witnesses in particular, drew attention to the, the, the consequential impacts that that that, that that may have uh, and really questioned whether or not um, thought, due thought had been given to the reporter system through that. Likewise, the Education Committee did a very thorough report and there was a great deal of concern that the reporter system was becoming particularly litigious and legalistic in nature. So that's the purpose of this amendment. Um, and, and point two, the, the, the matter is whether the Children's Report Administration continues to perform its role to a satisfactory standard in consequence of the additional responsibilities conferred upon it. That's the central premise. Now, this is a probing amendment. I recognise that the government cannot um, uh, accept um, uh, uh, reviews and reports um, in every single bill and perhaps as widely stated as this one. But I would urge the government to take the points that I'm making seriously and think about conducting a full and proper review, both in terms of the functioning of the board, but also the resources it has available in order to do its very important work, which I think is at the, the very foundation of the approach that we take to children in the justice system in Scotland. Thank you. Do any other members wish to speak to this amendment? Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, I appreciate the thinking behind this amendment, as I did with Mr Mundell's amendment at 118. I agree that it's crucial to monitor the changes that this bill brings and to ensure that this information is collated um, in order to properly evaluate the impact that this bill has on the lives of the children it affects. There are clear and established mechanisms to analyse cases involving children reported to the Children's reported, in, Reporter, including on offence grounds, and the investigations and decisions which which flow from that. SCRA publishes its annual report at the end of every October, and the principal reporter provides this report to Parliament. Online and published statistical analysis is also available, setting out data on children and cases referred to the children's report and decisions taken. An online statistical dashboard also provides further accessible information. However, focusing on the role of just one agency when there are others involved in supporting children wouldn't cover the full picture. And as I said on, on day one of stage two, we need a strategic approach to collating, monitoring and reporting on measures in this bill, one that takes into account all of the public services involved. I've already indicated my willingness um, to bring forward appropriate <coughs> amendments in that regard at stage three, so I would hope that Mr Johnson would agree with this approach and not press this amendment. If pressed, I would ask members to resist. I thank her for giving way. Would she accept the point, I mean, I, I accept the point that there is ongoing information, but this is rather a more holistic look at, at actually the, the role and functioning of the reporters, uh, 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 the reporter system uh, as a whole, and whether or not it's, it's still um, upholding the, the purposes that was uh, uh, set out to deliver, because um, I don't believe that statistics would really give, provide that picture. <coughs> Okay, so I think with regard to this bill, we need to be taking a wider, more strategic look at what information we collate. And I think that, you know, possibly um, that's a slightly <coughs> separate issue that you're raising there. I'm more than happy to discuss it um, and see if we can find a way forward before stage three. I agree that there is a need to understand very well um, what is happening in the children's hearing system, what decisions are being made and how we can further improve our approach to responding to the needs of children, not just their deeds. Daniel Johnston to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment please. Thank you Vina. I, I, I think I, I, I uh, set out my case at length when I uh, opened. I don't really have anything further to add but I do believe that the children's support system is a, a cherished part of our, our justice system and, and does need to be examined uh, but I'll be withdrawing my amendment. Okay. Are members agreed that Mr Johnson can withdraw his amendment? Yeah. The question is that sections 64 and 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 98 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 82. Minister to move formally, please. Moved. 
question is that Amendment 98 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 74 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 73 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 121 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 76 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. <coughs> Call Amendment 75 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 99 in the name of the Minister in a group of its own. Minister to move and speak to the amendment, please. Thank you. Uh, amendment 99 is a minor technical amendment and corrects an omission highlighted by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The amendment inserts the words give full effect to into section 67 of the bill so that the power is consistent with other ancillary provisions of this type and ensures that the power provides Scottish ministers with the necessary flexibility to give full effect to the bill and provisions made under it. Thank you. Any members wish to comment? No. Content to move. move. Yep. The question is that amendment 99 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 67 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 78 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 77 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 79 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 81 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 80 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that Section 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Call Amendment 59 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 58 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. That ends stage two consideration of this bill. Can I thank the Minister and her officials for attending? The committee will next meet on Thursday, the 28th of February, when we will begin oral evidence on the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. Thank you. I close.